Kilo Sierra, departing 3 1, South Departure Falcon. What's up, E3? Here in front of my favorite plane, the Mighty Viper. We're going to start out and just do a little show and tell about some of the aspects of the F-16 and what makes it great. But I wanted to start with a paint scheme. So you'll notice this one looks a little bit different than most F-16s out there. This is the Hab Glass 5 paint, so radar absorbent. It looks very similar to F-35. In fact, it's the same radar absorbent paint that they're using there. Metals in there, science, magic, making the radar cross section, the RCS of the F-16, even smaller. It's a small plane. When you talk to F-15 pilots and other adversary pilots that have to fight F-16s, they always complain about how small it is. And that's one thing you use to your advantage when flying and fighting the F-16, is just the small size. So, really cool, I think, the way the paint looks. Maintenance might have a different perspective. But let's just walk around. Got the pilot's name up there, who actually is one of my buddies. It's kind of a small world. This is a Madison, Wisconsin guard jet and it probably will only be flying for another few months. They're transitioning to the F-35, so soon this one will be heading to the Boneyard or possibly another fighter squadron. It's a Block 30, big mouth F-16, so the intake is large. We'll, we'll get around the back. The tail number is 87, so this jet rolled off the assembly line in 1987. Again, big mouth Block 30. I never flew it, talking the guys did. It brought a lot of power to it. It was almost, if not equivalent, to the Block 50 that I flew, which had a big motor. So looking around, underneath the red covers, we have the angle of attack indicators. So AOA, the AOA indicators is a critical feature of the jet. It's a fly-by-wire jet. It uses computers, sensing to make this thing fly. It's inherently unstable, which makes it very maneuverable, but it requires smart computers to make the jet fly. There's some stories of those AOA probes freezing over and actually losing jets. It's one of the first things you check when you start doing your walk around to make sure it's free of any debris, to make sure it's able to move freely so in the air you're gonna get proper data to the jet. There's four bumps just above the canopy. That's the interrogator. So in the nose here you have the radar the radar is what you're gonna to use to go out there and find the bad guys, the good guys, whatever. But if you go out there and fight, finding the bad guys, you're gonna use the radar to get the lock. The four bumps on the nose is the interrogator. What that's gonna do is actually send a signal out and it's going to interrogate that aircraft's IFF. So their squawk code. There are multiple sets of squawk codes that military jets fly with, especially in combat. And you're interrogating to make sure they have the proper squawk code and they're squawking up friendly. If they're not, that's something you can utilize to upgrade them to an enemy and a hostile aircraft to potentially shoot depending on the rules of engagement. So those four little bumps are pretty important up there. Um, and again, it's a nice touch. Moving around. Looking up at the canopy, slightly different. One, the canopy is awesome as the bow. I always equate it to sitting on the end of the rocket engine with it you know, strapped to your back. You strap the F-16 on, that bow in the canopy gives you so much vision outside into the world, not only to the fight, but looking over, if you're doing close air support, things of that nature with it. But you can see the dots up there. Not all F-16s have that. So the Jehemix Joint Helmet Mounted Queuing System, active duty units fly with that. That's the thing that kind of looks like a bug. It does a weapons data repeater over one eye, as well as some flight data information like airspeed, altitude, target information so if you have a radar lock it'll actually cue to the direction where your radar lock is because you're trying to gain sight of the enemy aircraft the guard has something slightly different so again this is a guard jet they're flying with a different system but it's doing the exact same thing that the jehemix is doing there for the active duty folks we'll kind of continue around you can see that there's a few static ports rescue which again uh, it's kind of self-explanatory for those in the aviation world as far as what that's going to do but you pull that handle the canopy is going to go away. Uh, you don't want to be near it because it weighs about 600 pounds. So what goes up must come down. You don't want to be on the end of that. Configuration, so the F-16 was designed to be a lightweight day VFR fighter. Back in the 60s when this concept came out, 
that's what it was gonna do. It was so reliable and so proven, we keep upgrading it over the years. In fact, we have over 20 nations that are flying F-16 just because of how robust and capable it is. So when it started, it looked much different as far as what stations, where the weapons and where the gas was hanging on this jet and the pods that would go on it. It was just air-to-air -air missiles, maybe a centerline take, clean, fast, high G, very maneuverable plane. Over time, multi-role needs have popped up. Close air support, long range air-to-air, -air, um, suppression of enemy air defenses is something that I did. And based upon the mission set you're doing, that configuration is gonna change. So we have nine stations, and on those nine stations, different things are gonna happen. Typically on the outboard station, you're gonna have two radar-guided missiles, AIM-120 AMRAMs. Inboard of that, you might have two AIM-9s, maybe an AIM-9X mic or an AIM-9X or an AIM-9 mic, and those are radar-guided, or uh, sorry, IR-guided missiles. They're gonna see the heat from the plume of the enemy aircraft's exhaust, and it's gonna guide on that. The radar missile is utilizing information passed from the radar lock, getting it going in the right direction, and then at some point, the onboard radar of that missile is gonna to guide to the enemy aircraft. So again, on the outboard stations, that's typically what you would find. As you move in, typically you have a, either a high-speed anti-aeration missile, a HARM, excuse me, a HARM, AGM-188, or potentially a mix of different bombs. So GB-31s, GB-38s, 54s, 39s. All that, it's a mix of 500 pound, 250 pound, or 2,000 class weapons. A lot going on. And then, next to that, probably near and dear to most F-16 pilots' heart, the fuel. So you have two fuel, external fuel tanks that you can put on there. You can actually put one on the center line as well, which is more of an air-to-air -air configuration. But that's going to give you a little bit more leg. So a combat configuration, you would see this jet looking similar. You would have, next to the intake, you would have either a sniper or a lightning pod. If it's a Block 50 jet, you have a harm targeting system on the other side. All that's feeding data up to the cockpit that the pilot is managing. So it's a lot going on there. And then as you move further out the jet, now you're gonna start having your weapons. So close air support, combat configuration where you're worried about potentially air-to-air -air engagement as well as doing air-to-ground work, say Syria or Iraq for that instance. You might have two 500-pound bombs on each side and a mix of laser-guided and GPS-guided weapons. So GBU-12 laser-guided, GBU-38 GPS-guided, and GBU-54 laser and GPS-guided weapons. And then as you move out even further, your IR, your uh, infrared-guided air-to-air missile, so AIM-9 mic or AIM-9X. And then as you go even further out, maybe two AIM-120s, so AMRAMs, the air -to -air, uh, medium-range air-to-air missile there, which would be radar-guided. A lot going on, and you're managing all that up uh, with just a couple toggle switches. So we'll move around. So a couple things. The F-16 likes going fast, right? So you do have some speed rakes right here, which will pop open uh, and slow you down, which sometimes you do need that. Uh, underneath, most people don't know this if you're not associated with the Air Force, but the F-16 actually has an arresting hook, which I have tested out a few times. It's not where you want to be in an F-16, but in the event that you have some kind of brake malfunction or brake failure, finding a runway with a cable. That's part of our mission planning, going to airfields that have an appropriate arresting gear. That's going to allow you to stop the aircraft so you don't go in, off the end of the runway, or potentially take a wild ride in an ejection seat. So you can dip down and see the arresting hook uh, right down there. It's not like a Navy hook where you're gonna, you know, catch and repeat. Once you use it, like there's a decent chance that there's gonna be some kind of damage to the aircraft, which is obviously less damage to the aircraft than it would be if you ran off the end of the runway because you had a brake failure. So the cable's a nice thing to have. It's not a fun day when you have to use it, but again, good to have. Uh, GE motor. Lots of thrust, so there's two different types, there's several different types of motor that go in the F-16, but two manufacturers, Pratt & Whitney and General Electric, and it's a mix between guard, reserve, and active duty jets that are flying either Pratt & Whitney or General Electric motors, and you can tell really easily by the turkey feathers, this is a GE motor um, that's flying here. So these are static wicks, but doing the demo, which I've shown you know, on social media a couple times, I would break these off. I probably have a thousand of these things, which they're breaking under high G. They're great for drink stirrers. Uh, so maybe like something special for some E3 members. It'd be kind of a cool giveaway. Kind of back to where we started, but I think a great way to finish up 
So the gun, call it turning the chainsaw on, it's always a fun time, but you have the M61 uh, 20 millimeter Gatling gun, 510 rounds of bullets going here. You got about five seconds on the trigger, so not a lot of time, and it's gonna be a mix of shooting their high incendiary rounds, target practice rounds, etc. But the gun is another thing, especially in close air support, that you might be using quite a bit, and it's an impressive thing. So, E3 members, I hope you enjoyed this kind of walk around, and I'll catch you next time.